Hey everybody, this is Seth Kniep, Kniep in It Real. Today I'm gonna to walk you through how to private label your own product. If you ever wanted to sell on Amazon and you're thinking, man, if I could just have a product and I can private label it and grow a brand and make money, well, this is the lesson for you. I'm gonna talk all the way from picking a brand name to trademarking it to how to build it into a brand that customers love. We have done this thousands of times now. We manage over 100 million in annual Amazon revenue and we have hundreds, literally, of stores. So this is something you're gonna get the best of the best from all of our experiences, our victories, and our failures right now. Now here traditionally is the problem with the term private label. Most people think it goes like this. So I find this product selling really well on Amazon. And I think, well, I wanna sell that product too. I mean, if they're making money, why don't I try? And so they find this product, let's just say it's a rain boot, and they think, well, private label means I put my own private label on the product, right? So let's do this. Boom, see, I private labeled. It's a product and it has my label on it. Now there was a day where this actually worked and that's where the term private label came from. But the term is misleading at best because the truth is if you do this and you launch that product on Amazon, chances are you're probably gonna lose all the money you sent to the supplier and get zero to very few sales because you didn't give me as a customer a reason to buy your product over the competitor. I mean, why would I buy it just because it has a cool logo on it? I don't know who you are. I don't know who your brand name is. And therefore just having a logo doesn't somehow make it more attractive or official. That is not any level of customization. So today I'm gonna to show you how to not do that and exactly what to do. Here's how it works. Your private label is not a logo on your product. Private labeling today must include customization of the product. It doesn't mean you have to go find a product designer and get a huge 3D model or a 3D printer and get a mold created necessarily. That's one way of doing it. There are other ways you can customize a product without having to do any of that. And today I'll show you exactly how to do that. The key is differentiation. When you decide to launch a product, you need to find out what are other competitors failing to do and how can you fix that problem by doing it better. In other words, find out what customers don't like and create a solution. But I'm not just gonna show you how to take a product and customize it. I'm gonna show you how to build that into a full-blown brand. So today I give you eight steps on how to take a brand new product, private label it into a full blown brand that actually makes you money. And guys, I'm not just talking about a little bit of money. If you would like to become a millionaire or add on 2000 a month, you may not even wanna become a millionaire. That's totally fine. This works if you do it right. There are several ways to choose brand names on Amazon that work and others that don't. Now, your brand name is not your company name. It's the brand under which you are selling your product. For example, McDonald's is a brand name. It is not the name of the company. The company has a different name, their legal structure set up internationally. The brand name is the one under which you do business that the world can see. In other words, it needs to match the product category so it makes sense. For example, you wouldn't get the brand name McGee Giggles if you are selling products for football players, that just wouldn't work. But that brand name, McGee Giggles, just might work if you're selling random gifts or gags for people at parties. So make sure the brand name matches the product category. First of all, you wanna pick a brand name that is defendable. By defendable, I mean, once it is trademarked, you are able to defend it and keep anyone else from using that brand name anywhere in the world based on where you are trademarked. I'm gonna give you four different levels of the kinds of brand names that you can or cannot use to get trademarked. Let's start with the most difficult. First of all, generic. A generic brand name would be something like a bookstore. Let's just say you are selling bookcases or bookends or something related to books. If you have the word bookstore or bookstore devices or bookends and that's the name that you want to get trademarked, chances are the United States Patent Trademark Office is going to reject your application because it's a common word that people should be able to use. 
if you got that trademarked and then I went out and said, hey, I want to sell bookends as well, I could not use the term bookstore or bookends if yours was trademarked, which is kind of ridiculous because that is an everyday kind of term. No one should be able to get rights to that name. Now let me take you to the next level, a little easier to get trademarked, but still a challenge. The next kind is descriptive. Now descriptive, an example of that would be Kitchen Aid. Now they did successfully get that name trademarked, which is kind of phenomenal, but it was still very difficult. And in a lot of situations, the examiner with the United States Patent and Trademark Office will not allow you to trademark that name. And the reason is because it's describing an everyday product, a little bit easier than the generic brand name, but still very difficult because it's describing what you're selling. And you know, these, these uh, tools, these utensils aid me in the kitchen. So we talked about generic names like bookstore. We talked about descriptive names like KitchenAid. Now let's talk about suggestive names like Ray-Ban. For example, sunglasses. They were successfully able to trademark that name. Even though it is somewhat of a common everyday term to use, it is still not 100% a common term. Ray-Ban, you don't walk around saying, hey, you got those Ray-Bans. You might say that as a logo, but not as a regular term. Yes, it does ban the rays from the sun. Yes, those are natural everyday words. But the nice thing about this brand name is it's very relevant to the kind of product that they're selling. It has a very suggestive element. Hey, I'm gonna put on my Ray-Bans. They ban the rays of the sun from my sensitive eyes to light. So it's definitely easier to get trademarked a suggestive name than one that is descriptive and then one that is generic. Let me give you the fourth level now, and that is fanciful. Fanciful means something that is completely not descriptive of any kind of term you would ever think of. For example, Kodak. I'm sure you've heard of Kodak. What does Kodak have to do with pictures? Nothing. I mean, even Amazon. Amazon has nothing to do with goods, but we have over the years have identified that term with the product that it represents. When you think of Kodak, even today, you probably think of taking a picture. So that is a very easy kind of name to get trademarked because it is so arbitrary. It is so fanciful. It is so made up. And the cool part is you get to use your imagination on this one and try to think of a term that really demonstrates the kind of product category you want to represent, but is as non-descriptive, as non-generic, and even as non-suggestive as possible, and your chances of getting it trademarked are much higher. Now, I will show you exactly how to get this trademarked in a moment. Pick a brand name that is unique. We talked about it being fanciful. Chances are it's going to be very unique if it's fanciful, but I wanna give you a tool where it's very easy to pull this off right now. I'd like you to navigate to namelix.com, namelix.com. Let's just pretend that the products that I want to sell are to help the feline family of cats. I'm gonna type in cat bubble backpack because that's the kind of product that I wanna sell. And I click on generate. And what you're gonna do here is click on short names and medium names. You don't want long names because a long name for a brand name just doesn't make sense. And now let's click on brandable names and then click generate. And this is gonna give you a huge host of all these ideas just based on what you typed in. So here we go. So from here, I'm already seeing not just names, but even design ideas if I wanna sell products for kittens. Popsy, <laughs> you cat, pood, cat leon, brat cat, that would be for sassy cats. Maggie dog, that one's foldfish. There's some really weird ones in here. What cat? So you already have this massive amount of ideas just from typing that in. Now I'm gonna go with one T I G E O N A Tigiona. I like it. It kind of sounds like a tiger, but it has kind of a cuteness, fuzzy sound to it as well. So let's just say our brand name is Tigiona. Pick a brand name that is available. Now that I found a brand name that is both fanciful. It's non-descriptive enough to be trademarkable and it's unique. I use name licks to find it. Now I need to make sure it is actually available. Now, what do we mean by this? Well, what if someone else is already using Tigiona? 
What if they're using it on Pinterest or Instagram or YouTube? Does that mean I can't use it or I shouldn't use it? I'm gonna show you right now exactly what to know about that. First of all, go to namechecker.com, name, C-H-E-C-K-R.com. And right here, I'm gonna type in Tigiona and let's see what this pulls up for me. Now immediately it's showing me all of the handles that are available and ones that are not as well. For example, Reddit is not available, aha, but YouTube is. GitHub is available, but Pinterest is not. Meetup is available. I don't know if you're gonna need that one for selling cat products unless you wanna get together with a bunch of people who love cats. Flickr is still around, oh my goodness, is available. WordPress is available. As you can see, there are a lot available. And if I want to, I can click load more and see even more. There's Etsy, there's LiveJournal, there's Mix, there's DeviantArt, there's eBay. I mean, this is giving me a ton of ideas. Now, notice the first one it shows is .com. As a general rule, if you're trying to build a brand, you don't have to have a website, but we do suggest it at some point. I mean, you can build an entire brand on Amazon just focusing on Amazon alone. Statistics prove, specifically Statista, that out of 100,000 Prime users, 25% of them are constantly going to Amazon to find a product or a product category that they can fall in love with. So people are very open to finding new brands. In fact, the whole melting of the brick and mortar and the rising of the internet, especially e-com where people can buy, is creating an atmosphere where people are more open to just falling in love with a new brand. So this is a great opportunity. But assuming you do want a website, .com still has the most authority. Now you could still get .cat, you could get .action, .biz, you have a .net, you have a lot of options. Don't feel like you have to be married to .com. Or maybe you could do tigionacats.com. That's another option in case Tigiona is already taken. But if Tigiona is taken and it talks about cats, that could create confusion and it could cause you to not be able to trademark your brand name. But if Tigiona is talking about structural engineering, for example, maybe there's a new kind of structural engineering or that's just what they call their brand, then you'd be perfectly fine to get tigionacats.com and build your brand around that and it would not cause confusion. Here's the way it works on trademarking. If you pick a brand name, that could cause confusion for someone else selling in the same product category, which in this case is for cats, and the name sounds similar or is the same, that would be reason for either your trademark application to be rejected, which you don't want, or someone who already has that brand name could contest it. They could come up and say, look, you can't use that. They send you a cease and desist. If you don't listen, they take you to court. They're probably gonna win. In fact, they could even have you hand over costs for damaged goods as well as the trademark. So that's why this part is so important. Okay, so let me, just to be clear, if you find Tigiona is the brand name you want to build your brand under, make sure that brand name is not being used by anyone else who is selling products in the same category. If they are, even if they're not trademarked yet, it doesn't matter. You could go get trademarked. And if they can come back and prove that before you got trademarked, they were already selling products in the feline category, then they would win that court case hands down. Because that comes under what is called common law first rights use. Whoever's using the name first gets rights to that brand name, regardless of the trademark. A lot of people, they get discouraged because when they go to Name Checker or Noem, K-N-O-W-E-M.com, it does very much the same thing as, as Name Checker does. When they go to these websites, they think, wow, a lot of these are taken. Well, hello, I mean, we do live in this century where the internet is becoming more and more used for everything. Don't get discouraged if that happens. All you need to do is ask yourself two questions. If I'm gonna build my brand online outside of Amazon or in addition to it, which social media platforms is it important for my brand name to be on? For example, if you are selling cat type products, then Pinterest might be a great place to be on. If you're selling clothing, you would think YouTube would be a good one because you can do reviews about the clothing and try it on and show. Instagram as well. Instagram is very picturesque and focused on beauty and art. That makes sense for handmade goods, clothing, fashion, health products. But if you're doing construction products, Instagram's probably not the best platform. Maybe a YouTube channel would make sense because you have a bunch of how-to videos on how to fix it yourself, DIY, you need to fix something, you, you create this YouTube video, and then in the video you feature the product that you're selling to help them accomplish their goal. 
So think about the appropriate platform that your brand would make sense on. TikTok is more funny videos, meme type of stuff, you know, dancing. That might not work for a car automotive company. <laughs> but Twitter might be great for tech products if you're doing headphones, Bluetooth wireless speakers, and so forth. All you need is one, two, maybe three different social media platforms to really say, okay, that's where I gotta be on. I don't care if the other ones are taken. But if the other ones are taken, still check to make sure that they're not selling a product in the same category under that brand name. Otherwise, you should not trademark this brand name. You need to go back to the drawing board and get a new name to protect yourself. One little pro tip here, you can add official before or after the name on social media if you want, if your name is already taken. So if it's like Tigiona, you could say official Tigiona, or if it's your own personal name, you know, Seth Kniep, you could do official Seth Kniep, or let's just say your name is Lucy Pickleberry. Official Lucy Pickleberry, if Lucy Pickleberry is already taken, if that's the name that you wanna build the brand under. Pick a brand name that is not already trademarked. Now, this kind of goes without saying, but the reason I first want you to go do what's called a knockout search and make sure no one else is using it online, it is more likely that that is where your brand name will already be used than on USPTO.gov. And even if you went to USPTO.gov and you said, hey, guess what, I'm good. The brand name's not on there, doesn't matter. Like I said, if someone else is using it, under that category, selling products, they get the first rights use under common law, and therefore you would be wasting your time going into USPTO.gov. Okay, so let's do this right now. We're gonna find Tigiona on USPTO.gov, or at least see if we can find it. So navigate to USPTO.gov, hover over trademarks, and then I want you to click on searching trademarks. From here, click this little, not very noticeable button, search our trademark database, Tess. She's pretty cool. Then click on basic word mark search new user. Don't worry, you don't have to get into the advanced searches, it's a waste of time. And now I'm gonna type in T-I-G-E-O-N-A, whoops, T-I-G-E-O-N-A, Tigiona, and see, okay. So this is great news, it tells me that no records were found. Perfect, that means that that name is not trademarked on USPTO.gov, so I'm good, right? No, I'm not, let me give an example. What if someone else trademarked a name that sounds similar? that would be contestable. Because remember what I said? It's not about making sure that your spelling is different. Well, mine has an I in it, and theirs doesn't have the letter I in it, so I'm good to go. No, no, no. If it sounds similar, that means it could cause confusion for contestants. So let me give you another example. Let's do this. Let's just say the name you want to get trademarked is Crazy8. So I'm gonna type in C-R-A-Z-Y-E-I-G-H-T and hit enter. But wait a minute. What if someone else, let me go back, what if someone else has crazy eight, A-T-E? Or what if it's the number eight? In other words, even though your crazy eight is E-I-G-H-T, if someone else has something that sounds the same or looks the same and it's the same product category, that would be contestable and you probably wouldn't be able to trademark the brand name. And that brings us to step number two, assuming your brand name, and we'll use Tigiona for now because it represents cute kitties. Assuming you got this far and everything's a green light, this is the next step you're gonna take is you're going to trademark your brand name. Now, you might be thinking, Seth, do I really have to trademark in order to build a private label brand on Amazon? No, you don't. Really? Yeah. Well, what do I do then? Well, first of all, you could just add the TM as a superscript right after the name. So it would be Tigiona, and then you have a superscript TM. That means trademark intent to use. Once it's registered, it becomes an R with the circle around it. But while it's a TM, you're telling the world, I'm claiming this, and you can sell under that brand name. And don't worry about someone else taking it. If you already discovered that no one else is selling under that brand name, under the same product category, and then later someone successfully trademarks the same or similar brand name under the, for the same product category, you could easily win that battle and say, uh-uh, I get first rights use under common law. So if you can't afford 
to get a trademark now, you can wait on this, but still pick your brand name and start selling products under that brand name and add TM. Heck, you don't even have to add TM in order to get first rights use under common law, but it does help prove your case that this was your intention from the beginning, and that looks very favorable to the United States Patent Trademark Office. So now we get to step number two, trademark your brand name. You have four options for how you can do this. You can either file it yourself, you can hire a lawyer to do it for you, you can hire a trademark service to do it for you, or you can use what is called IP Accelerator, which is one of the most beautiful things that Amazon has ever done, and I cannot wait to show you how to do it. First of all, let's talk about filing for it yourself. The cost for trademarking a brand name is gonna be a minimum of $250 per class. Sometimes it's 275, depending on various details, which I'm not gonna go into right now. What do you mean by class? I mean category. If you are trademarking for boots, then there are certain categories that cover boots and other ones that cover leather products. In other words, you could get this put under or trademarked under two different classes, as long as they are specifically relevant to your product. And it's important to pick out which classes you want now, not later. Because if later you're like, hmm, I got it under footwear, but I didn't get it under rubber, assuming this is a rubber boot, you can't later go back and add rubber. You would have to do a brand new application and go through the entire process again, which can take anywhere from six months to 12 to 18 months. So make sure you know all the classes or classifications and for understanding categories that you want your product type to be trademarked underneath. I'm going to walk you through in a future video exactly how to trademark it yourself, but let me give you some words of wisdom right now. I've done it myself and I've hired lawyers to do it for me, so I understand both. Your chances of doing something wrong or missing a point are higher if you do it yourself. Can you? Yes. And if you're low on funds and you got time on your hands, then I recommend you do it yourself. Just make sure you are paying very close attention to the details as you walk through this process because what will happen is after you apply, the United States Patent Trademark Office is going to assign an examiner, a person who will follow along and look at your trademark and send you emails and say, I need this. I need proof that you're using it. I need to see the logo and you have to follow through on those and you have 30 days to reply to each. Otherwise, your application will be auto canceled. So you will save money, less money to spend. Your risk is higher of doing it wrong if you file for it yourself. Your second option is to hire a service to do the trademark for you. Now, as I mentioned, per class, it's around $250. So if you do two classes, you want your product to be under two categories, that's $500. As a general rule of thumb, you're gonna spend about another 250 to 300 hiring a service to do it for you. Now, in this situation, you're gonna spend a little more, but your chances of it going wrong are lower, which is good. Are they gonna be as thorough as a lawyer? Absolutely not. Could they miss something? Could they not do a super comprehensive search for you in order to make sure no one else is using it? Chances are they could miss that much more easily because they are set up for scale. They want volume. As many people coming in and they just check it off as fast as they can. Here's an example where LegalZoom offers you this option. Here you have basic, 250 bucks plus the federal filing fee, which is what I mentioned before, it's United States Patent Trademark Office. And then you can have an attorney-led version where you have a little more interaction with an attorney. Now that's still a pretty good price for working with an attorney, but I can tell you something about LegalZoom. They do have a great plan for scaling services, but when it comes to personalization, being able to talk to an attorney, then providing all the feedback you need, it's not nearly as robust as if you go with an attorney whose primary expertise is trademark law, and this is exactly what they do for a living. Option number three is you can hire a lawyer to do it for you. Now, this is where you're gonna spend more. I mentioned it's about 250 per class. You'll spend anywhere from 1,000 to about 1,500 having a lawyer do it for you as a general rule. But they handle everything, and if they need anything, they will talk to you. Usually you can call them on the phone or you can send them an email and they'll explain everything needed in order to pull this off. In other words, they are there at your service to make it as easy and simple as possible. Option number four, this is my favorite by far, is Amazon's IP Accelerator. Now keep in mind, one of the main reasons people who sell on Amazon want a trademark is because without a registered trademark, they cannot get their brand brand registered. 
and brand registry means you get to add A plus copy to your listing, which I'm gonna show you in a minute. You have more tools. You can see different levels of search volume. You have brand analytics, which is a super powerful tool. Amazon will side with you more in case someone is copying your product or trying to hijack and sell under your listing, like piggybacking on it, pretending like they are an arbitrager when really they're just cheating and manufacturing the same product under your brand name. It gives you a lot of advantages. And here's the best part. Instead of waiting six to sometimes 18 months to get your trademark registered, so then you can get brand registered, with the lawyers who are in the IP Accelerator program, even though your trademark won't be registered any faster, once your application is in and they've approved it, Amazon will allow you to get brand registered within weeks. I'm talking as fast as three weeks. This is incredible, which means immediately you have better advantage because now your listing's way more beautiful. It converts better than your competitors who are taking the long path. And what's even more cool about this is you won't spend that much more using Amazon's IP Accelerator. Let me show you what I mean. This is where you go, brandservices.amazon.com slash IP Accelerator. This is where you go in order to get started and it's gonna have you automatically log into your Seller Central account. Then you will fill out an application after you select the lawyer service you want. My recommendation when you do this is pick a lawyer who has good star ratings, like 4.5 to five, but not a ton. Because in my experience, when I picked one who had a ton, it took them forever to get back to me. It was a ridiculous waste of time. But when I picked one who had good star ratings to do a good job, but not a ton of reviews, that means they're hungry for more business. They'll work faster and harder for you because they need that business. And therefore there's incentive for them to do a badass job. They haven't gotten too big and fat and lazy to not care anymore. What will happen is you will follow the steps. It'll cost about $1,200. It's gonna vary on, in the fees alone. And then of course you still have to pay USPTO's fees for filing and for each class. But they will walk you through the process and within weeks, you can be up and running and have your brand name on Amazon brand register. Design your brand. First, you need to create a draft, a first copy of your brand image. Now, some people are thinking, Seth, I'm not a Photoshop person. I'm not into Adobe design. I don't design stuff. It's totally fine. But if you want to save both time and money, which are two very viable assets, you need to understand how they work when building a business. I'm gonna give you a technique that will save you both on those, even if, if there is not a design bone in your entire body. Go to Luka.com. And right here, you can just start typing in exactly what you want. So let's just say, okay, you know, company name, I want it to be, just call it Tigiona for simplicity. I hit enter or get started. Okay, what kind, what is this? This is, I'm just gonna call it retail. Actually, let me see if there's anything on cat. I doubt it. They have cattle, feline, no. Nope. Okay, let's just try retail. Perfect, online retail, there we go. And then I'm gonna hit continue. Okay, so what it's doing now is you're gonna select a few logos that you are attracted to that would match the feel of your brand. So I'm thinking feline. I think this Oredian looks pretty cool. I like this butterfly one. I like this one. This one looks too ominous. This one's too race car-ish looking. Kind of like the chill tea one. Okay, so I picked four. What you're doing is you're telling them these are the kinds of designs I am drawn to or that I think would fit my brand. Now I'm gonna pick some colors. I'm gonna go with purple and yellow. I'm gonna hit continue. And what's happening is it's gonna tell them, okay, this is what we need to put together for you. And now I'm gonna type in adventure together. Adventure to, yeah, they're, they're telling me this is hard to read. No, I think it's great. I like it, adventure together. In other words, you got your cat inside your cat bubble backpack. You're going to the park. You're on an adventure together. I hit continue. Okay, symbol types. Hmm, definitely not baby clothing, not fashion. I'm gonna go with abstract. I'm gonna go with heart because I know my customers love cats. People who are cat crazy, they love cats. My wife is a cat person. I am technically not a cat person. <laughs> All right. Okay, let's just go with abstract and heart and see what that does. 
Okay, now they're generating logos for me. Now, notice that took me literally two minutes of my time. And this is important. It forced me to think through what is the feel and look of my brand, which is so important because it allows me to create a story, which I'm gonna teach you how to do today, because the story of your brand is the number one most important thing you can do to build trust in that brand so that it will grow, take on a life of its own, and someday create you passive income so that you have margin to do the things you love with the people you love. And boom, here we go, Tigiona, look at this. Okay, this one looks interesting, a big yellow T. This one's kind of cool, it's purplish. That almost looks like DNA or something. Um, that one's nice, almost looks like a cat paw print. Here you have the heart. I'm already getting ideas. Let me show you the one that we created in advance, and to be totally, frankly, transparent, one of our staff members who loves cats, <laughs> he created this one. So this is what he came up with, which I actually think is really cool. It does have sort of a tiger look. Tigiona, Adventure Together, it's got the orange. I love the, the kind of ripped edges around the square of the, of the middle. And it even shows you what will this look like on a phone, on a website, on letterhead, on a business card. Now again, this did not take me very long, but it's done. Not the logo, but the first step. Now I'm gonna hire a professional logo brand name designer to do the final touches. For example, if I need a vector file version of this, which means it's infinitely zoomable without losing the quality, you don't see pixels, well, they can do that for me. If there's something they're thinking about, um, Seth, did you want different versions of this to fit like one on a website, one as a favicon on your URL, one for your logo, they can do all that for me. I don't have to worry about it. But because I'm going to send them what I just designed on Luca and give it to them, it gives them a really great place to start. This means I will spend way less money and even more importantly, way less time going back and forth trying to make sure they get it right, they already have something very visible to go with. And it's kind of fun as well. Like you just spend about five, okay, maybe an hour, right? If you think it, about it a lot, of your day to save you many more hours and a lot of dollars just by doing that. So just go to Fiverr. Here I am at Fiverr and I'm just gonna click on logo design and it automatically pulls this up. Now I have all these different kinds of logo designs. I like minimalist. I'm not about having a lot of clutter. I like things to be simple, clean, fast moving. So let's go there. All right, and now I can pick, okay, who do I think could make a design similar to what I designed on Luca? Who would do that? Well, I can look at their design. I mean, everyone has their own personality traits and unique tendencies. So some logo designers are naturally gonna be better at that than others. So I'm gonna look for one that looks as close to Tigiona as possible, and I'm gonna send them the sample, which is gonna make it super easy for them. Easy money for them, easy for me, everybody's happy, we all rejoice. <laughs> Before I move on, I wanna share one thing with you. A lot of times when you're building out a brand, you're gonna notice that your logo, which is called your design mark with the United States Patent Trademark Office, and your brand name, which is called your word mark, are one and the same, McDonald's. In fact, they even put the, I'm loving it, the slogan in there as well. They got the M, it says McDonald's, and they got the slogan. Starbucks, you have this image of this like mermaid, mermaidish woman, and then you have the name Starbucks underneath, or I think it's Starbucks coffee underneath as well. It's one and the same, you can do that. But when you trademark it at USPTO.gov, you're gonna trademark it in all caps. It doesn't mean you have to use it in all caps, but let me give you an example. If you trademark T-I-G-E-O-N-A in all caps, that means if it's lowercase, it's still protected. But if you trademark it capital T, lowercase I-G-E-O-N-A, then it's not protected if you do it in all caps. That's why when you go to USPTO.gov and you look up trademarks, everything's in caps. And you thought people were just yelling when they typed. <laughs> Step number four, weave a story into your brand. In my opinion, this is the number one most underlooked part of building a private label brand on Amazon or anywhere in the world, even if you're in a brick and mortar store. Notice that the best brands today have a great story. Your brand is not a logo. Your brand is not a trademark. Your brand tells a story. 
Since the beginning of time, people have loved stories. Even your logo in its own little way is telling a story. So build a brand that tells that story. A story about the company you're building. A story about the people you work with. A story, most importantly, about the customer and their experience with their loved felines. Think about cats. I mean, it is not hard to come up with lots of funny memes and stories and ideas and thoughts around one's experience with a cat. A cat is generally more aloof. A dog is lovey and slobbery and happy. <laughs> Two very different kinds of creatures created. So it's not very hard to weave a story into cats. If you understand your customer, then you can write a story. And remember, the key thing about the story, it's not so much who it's about, but that the customer can connect with it. Without a story, you're gonna find it very difficult to stand out from the noisy world of social media. Everyone has something to share. Everyone has an idea. Everyone's pushing for this and that. It's so important that you simply tell a story people connect to, and all of a sudden, your tribe will find you, and they will fall in love with your product if you build a great product, if you surprise and delight them when they receive that product, and that's how a brand grows and then takes on a life of its own. Here's what's so cool. Once people know the story, every time they see your logo or your design mark, that story will cause them to recognize it. Nike, swoosh, just do it. That's a story. Move to action, let's go. Stop hesitating, don't be afraid. Take the leap, build your wings on the way down. Do you see what I just did? I literally just pulled that out of my mind because I know the Nike story. Well, if I'm running, if I'm moving and those swooshes are on my shoes, swoosh. No wonder Michael Jordan does such a great job popularizing that logo because it tells a story that people can relate to. Now someone's gonna say, well, Seth, how do I write that story? Well, every great story has three elements. Where you've been, where you are today, and where you're headed. And again, it doesn't have to be about you personally. You may wanna be completely anonymous, completely fine. But remember, it has to be a story that the customer can connect to. Because customers don't really buy things. They buy into what your brand stands for and what your products represent and how they make them feel. When someone buys Tom's shoes, they're not really buying shoes. They're buying the program one for one. When someone buys a product on Amazon, they're not really buying a product on Amazon. They're buying into this feeling of from A to Z. Have you noticed the little swoosh-like mark, the little arrow that goes from A to the Z? That's a very subtle story right there told in the logo that we got everything. We're not just books. You know how many times Jeff Bezos had to tell people we're not just a bookstore. He had to literally retell his story to get people to think, wait, Amazon is everything from A to Z. That's a story subtly told. It's not elaborate, it's not fancy, but it's still there and it influences people's trust for that brand. Up to this point, I've taught you how to plan out your private label brand. Now I'm gonna teach you how to build that private label brand. That brings us to step number five, build a product that solves a problem. Now there are two kinds of problems you can solve in this world. There are perceived problems and there are real problems. Now for the realists, they're gonna go, why in the world would I solve a perceived problem? That just feels fake and empty and kind of stupid. I get it. And other people, they're like, well, <laughs> I get it completely. I do wanna sell a perceived problem because I understand design and fashion and feeling and all that. Understand both are equally legit. Let me give you an example of a perceived problem. If someone prefers a different color, that is a perceived problem. Does it really add the actual value to this boot? Does it keep rain out better? Nope. Does it make it more comfortable? Nope. Then why do I want yellow boots? Well, because when I was a kid, I watched that 1950s movie, Singing in the Rain, and I love tap dancing. And so somehow it just makes me feel like I'm singing in the rain, even though I live in West Texas. <laughs> you see where I'm going? That's an example of a story. You're also tying into perceived value with the story. So if you find that people are saying, you know, I bought these boots on Amazon, but I wish they had a yellow pair, boom, there you go. You didn't just slap on a silly logo, you actually added value and made this yellow. The other reason is because people don't like the function. 
So the first one is I don't like the look. The second is I don't like the function. Okay, what do you mean function? Well, if these are uncomfortable, that's function. I have to walk in these. And if I end up with blisters on my heels after only 20 minutes, we have a problem, son. Can we have a softer sole? What about the material? Maybe it's so stiff. I've actually experienced this before, where when it goes, when you bend, it bends, this cuts into your ankle and it hurts and it needs to be softer. That's a functional fix. That's a real value. Color, even your photos and your copy on your listing is perceived value, by the way. It's important. Packaging, that's perceived value. Real value is, how does this thing work? How good is it? What's it like? Is it tough? Is it strong? Is it fixing my problem? Both work. The cool thing is if you're short on funds, you can start with perceived value because as a general rule of thumb, perceived value is less expensive to fix. It will stretch your brand growing mind and your ability to tell a story. But then later, as you make more money, then you can upgrade the value of the product and that's where it gets into the real value. Step number six, build a listing that removes objections. Every time someone walks into a store and they're standing there and they're looking at all these products, do you know what they're doing? They are going through in their mind all the reasons they don't want to buy the product. Well, it's too black. I would like a white one or a yellow one. It's just too dreary looking. I want it to stand out. Or, well, is it comfortable enough? Maybe it's too heavy to walk with. They're going through all these objections in their mind. So when you create that listing on Amazon, your job is to remove those objections. You have to anticipate what they're gonna say no to and every single thing from the first photo to all the photos, the title, the bullet points, the description, one by one, you're removing objections until they say, yes, I'm willing to part with my money so I can take your product home. Or in this case, have it shipped to my house within one to two days. I wanna give you a couple examples of a really great listing and a horrible one. Here is an excellent listing. The first thing that stands out to me is a very cute face on a kitty. And it looks like it's looking up to its master, its owner. That's incredible. Like immediately someone's already, I mean, I'm not even a cat person and I'm feeling it. I'm already feeling a little connection to this cat. Now that's funny. We're not selling a cat. We're selling a backpack. So why are you talking about the cat, Seth? Because the cat is the model. The cat is demonstrating for me an experience that I can relate to. It's telling me, look, Seth, your cat could also fit inside this cute little backpack and look how happy he'll be. Now, we know that's kind of silly because just because this cat looks happy doesn't mean mine will be happy, but people are still impressionable, emotional creatures, and therefore this is gonna influence my perception of the value of this product. And the very first one shows a cute cat. Now let me show you a terrible example of a listing. No cat. I see a backpack, I see reflections in the first photo, and I don't know what they represent, but it looks pretty bad. I see multiple pictures of it from all sides. I see a woman holding it, but I don't see a cat. Where's the cat? Look, I bought this because I like cats. Do you really think I'm buying this for the backpack? No, I'm buying it because I love my cat. You see where I'm going? The first one, go back to this one. This one tells you something. This, the creator of this listing understands their customer. They wanna go shopping with their cat. <laughs> My wife better not watch this video. She's gonna to wanna to go shopping with their cats too. They wanna to go hiking with their cat, traveling. They wanna to go to the vet with their cat. Like, oh man. And now all of a sudden that adventure together makes sense. Do you see how the story's already being written in my mind? This is an adventure. This is a story. The adventure with your cat. Already just seeing the brand name and logo tell me something about this brand. And that's something people will connect to. And that is a reason for them to buy your product. I want you to notice something else. Look at, I'm going to scroll down here. And by the way, this is the same listing. I'm just scrolling through the photos. See all those? Look at that. I mean, they even have one for at nighttime camping. <laughs> That's so funny. It's obviously it was Photoshop, not the greatest picture, but it still gets the idea across. Look at this. Okay, ship from US warehouse. People like that. You mean I'm not gonna have to wait three weeks for it to come from China? This tells me this seller knows 
that a vast number of people selling cat bubble backpacks are selling them from China and you wait weeks. I mean, it's happened in our home multiple times. We'll buy something. And my wife, and my wife says, Seth, um, it's been like 13 weeks. I forgot I even bought it. I said, that's ridiculous. And finally it showed up and it's obvious it came from China. They, this seller knows that. Therefore, they already removed an objection by saying it ships from the US warehouse. That my friend is real good marketing. That's simply common sense, but it's also brilliant. Look at the next one, breathable space. Who wants their cat to be suffocated? I bet you they found in critical reviews from competitors who complained that it was stuffing the inside, the cat came out sweaty, meowing, and there wasn't enough ventilation going on inside that backpack. Look at the next one. Eco-friendly and non-toxic pet safe materials made. Safe for my cat, that's very important. Perhaps many cat lovers are very eco-sensitive and therefore they include that in here. Two carrying ways. It's a strange way to say that, but I think we get the idea. Portable and wearable shoulder pet carrying. Care. Okay, you know what I'm gonna find out right now? Do they give us a picture of you holding it on your back? They don't. So that's something they could improve on. If they had a picture of a human wearing this on their back, now that immediately allows me to vicariously live through that experience and say, ha, if they can do that, I can do that too. Are more of these customers men or women? That would be smart because then that would tell me whether the model should be a man or a woman. If more women are buying these, then it's gonna be a woman model. If more men are buying these, then it's gonna be a man model. See what's happening? Literally through explaining to you how to write a listing, I'm teaching you how to create the story. This is the story, you guys. You're understanding their experience and you're creating a full experience for them through the listing, making me want to say goodbye to my money and hello to that cat bubble backpack. So you're gonna anticipate your customer's wants and objections. You're also gonna focus on benefits over features. And as I just showed you, instead of saying, hey, this cat backpack has, you know, special nylon, you're gonna say the nylon is breathable, it ventilates. Or instead of saying it's this many centimeters big, you're gonna start with very roomy for your cat. Maybe you could put two or three cats in there. Then after that, you explain the scientific evidence to back up that benefit. Features and benefits are not the same thing. A benefit is what you need to lead with. Then you share the scientific evidence like here's how many millimeters it is or how many inches. Here's how many square inches it holds. Here's what it can endure in the sun. But start with it's shady, it's cool. Then say why. That way you're addressing both parts of the brain, both the emotional experiential side and the analytical side that needs the scientific evidence to back up the argument. Assuming you used Amazon's IP accelerator to get brain registered or you successfully got a trademark, you can now design your listing with what is called A plus content formerly called enhanced brand content. There was a day when only Amazon seller vendors could do this. Well, now third-party sellers can do the same. Let me show you a quick demonstration of how amazing this is. So watch this. If I scroll down, you're gonna see something really cool. Look at this. Now I can see, what? Our story? <laughs> They're including their story. I talked to you about stories and that's important. This allows you to connect a bit with the founder. Her name is Amanda Wall. She's not just some random person. Now it doesn't mean you have to include your name, but this is still a very smart move. This, is, this whole area here is called A plus content. It allows you to create a beautiful listing. If you didn't get a trademark or didn't use Amazon's IP accelerator, you would have none of this. Like, look at this picture right here. This is so cool. Like, I love this. It, it looks like they're at Zoker Park here in Austin. You got two cats, two backpacks. They both look happy. They have a leash on them. Someone please teach me how you taught a cat to be in a leash. I have no idea. I'm so glad you asked, Seth. Tiki here is gonna show me how you can walk a cat on a leash. First, you get your cat used to a harness, like this one. Next, get your cat inside of a cat bubble backpack. Next, you can take your cat out carefully, making sure that the leash is attached. Many cat bubble backpacks have this hook that attaches to the leash so they can't escape. Next, you bait your cat forward with some treats. Come on, Tiki. Yeah, you want this. Soon enough, they'll be leading you to where you want to go and you can adventure together.
this is really cool. You see someone hiking on the beach, someone in the sand. You can see the other options, the black, the green, the pink. Do you see where this is going? This is creating an experience for me and it's making me more and more want to buy this. Heck, maybe I should buy this for my wife now. <laughs> Okay, I got two more steps. Step number seven, build a follow-up that delights your customers. Now, how in the world do you do this on Amazon? Especially with Amazon restricting, heavily restricting, what kind of messages you can send to your customers? Well, ask yourself a simple question. How can I add over-the-top value to my customer when they receive that item? Let me give you an example. Yeti. Yeti has done a phenomenal job on this. We bought this on Amazon for the simple fact of demonstrating it for you and how it works. So first of all, I received this in the mail here at the Just When I'm office. I open it up, because you know, of course you're gonna open it up. How are you gonna put water in it? And I notice something inside. Hey, I got an extra straw. I like that. This probably cost them three cents, like 0.04 RMB, but I got an extra straw. You know, it may not blow my mind, but it does tell me they're thinking about me. They're not going bare minimum. They want to enrich my experience, even with this little tiny bundled add-on. What else do we got? Okay. So this is just like a warning thing. Over-engineered, huh? Double wall vacuum, ultra leak resistant, BPA free, dishwasher safe, all the things that are important to most people today. That adds value. There's something still better I have to show you. And that is this. Register your Yeti. This is called a lead magnet. They are giving me incentive to register my warranty so I can stay up to date on what's new and in case something goes wrong when I'm out hiking in the rugged mountains, I have the security to know not only I could get this fixed for free, but it tells me this brand is so serious that they're willing to put their money where their mouth is by giving me this. Now I have incentive to go to a very easy website, yeti.com slash register, and they have a QR code where I can scan it. I put in my information quickly and boom, I feel better. But what did they do? They now have my name and they have my email, which means they can add value to me. They can send me an email and say, hey, Seth, wanna make sure you got that extra straw. Hey, Seth, how are you enjoying it so far? Hey, Seth, let me give you three tips on how to get the most out of your Yeti Tumblr. You see what's happening? They're building an experience. This is how we build brands on Amazon. We don't just give them a product, we surprise and delight them. Here's the challenge I have for you. First, the people, the shoppers, need to fall in love with your listing on Amazon. It needs to look better than all the other listings. It needs to stand out. Just like I showed you with the cat bubble backpack peeps. Second, when I receive the actual physical product, this has to be better than the listing. The reason people leave positive reviews is because you surprised and delighted them. Not because the product was good. Most people will not leave a product if they got what they expected. Thank you. I parted with my money. It was a fair deal. I owe you nothing. You owe me nothing. We will go on our merry way. That is not how you get a review. You get a review by surprising and delighting them. You get a review by doing more than they expected. And they go, man, this is even better. And now you feel emotionally gratified. And that's why you leave a positive review. Look at it this way. It's the same reason people leave critical reviews. They never leave a critical review because the product was bad. They leave a critical review because expectations were not met. Managing expectations is one of the most important things you can do when working with your customers. This is a lead magnet. It leads me to a page where now they can add value to me and market. And maybe next month they come out with a deal. Hey, you buy two, you get 20% off or something else or share this with your friend or leave us a review on Amazon. Boom, now I get more reviews because of that. All because they took the time to set this up correctly. My friends, that is adding value. This is how you over deliver. So how do you do this? You construct or build out a simple landing page. Put your logo on there, a couple pictures, and then two boxes. One says name on the inside and one says email. And above it, it says register your warranty. As simple as that. Let me give you an example. If you go to jod.com insert, we will send you for free 
14 different product insert examples and they'll be a lot better than this one. Like really beautifully designed that will give you ideas for creating your own lead magnet. No questions asked. See what I just did? That's a lead magnet. I'm literally offering you a lead magnet. And I promise I'm not gonna send you a bunch of marketing emails. Those are very rare. We will send you content only and with your permission. But go here, go to jod.com slash insert. It'll auto direct to this longer URL. And all you do is you come down here, type in your name, type in your email, click get the examples, it'll be emailed to you. That's a landing page. That's exactly what Yeti's doing. It's the same thing. It's adding value. This is the beauty of building a business. You literally get to help people and enrich their life and improve their life. There's actual joy in that having nothing to do with money. But if you do it well, people will pay you money because you're giving them value and they appreciate that. That's how Yeti went from nothing to a huge company today with a recognized brand. There's something else you need to know before I give you the point number eight. Do you know that Yeti charges far more than the average Tumblr seller on Amazon? How do they get away with that? Because they added value, there's trust. It is in a recognized known brand name. People know if they buy Yeti, they're getting a good product. They thought about this a long time ago. What do you think their margins are on this? Probably insane. I don't know, but I would guess that these cost $1.25, $1.75 to manufacture. If they sell these things for like $30, $40, those are massive profit margins. Would you rather be that kind of person, that kind of Amazon seller who builds a brand? Or would you rather be someone who just sells stuff on Amazon at little, tiny little 15, 20% margins? I've had so many people say, ah, oh, on Amazon, you won't get better than 20% margin. That's because of two things. Number one, they don't understand the system. They don't understand how to find high profit products. And number two, they're not building a brand. Step number eight, I love this one because it's so easy and it's fun. Treat your first 100 customers like absolute royalty. Well, how do you do this, Seth? Well, first of all, include unexpected gifts, kind of like this that I showed you. By the way, I didn't even mention this, but look, here's the Yeti sticker. Have you noticed that campers absolutely love to put stickers everywhere? This tells me Yeti understands their customer. Campers and people who travel love to show stickers that demonstrate where they've been or the cool experiences that they've had. They put them on their bumpers, they put them on their tumblers, they put them on their coffee mugs. This tells me they didn't just throw a sticker in there because it's cute. And I've seen a lot of Amazon sellers do that. Oh, if Yeti's doing it, well, I'll do it too. Well, do you think that your cat loving customer would actually like a sticker? You need to first ask that question. You need to find something that's a value to them. This, although it's super cheap to produce, I'm talking probably 0 0.0 some cents a piece. This adds value. This treats them like royalty. Let me give you another example of how you can treat them like royalty. Answer all of their questions you or anyone you've hired on your team when they ask them on Amazon. Do not leave it to other shoppers and other customers to answer those questions for you. Let me show you. Watch this, guys. I'm gonna go down on this listing until I see the questions and answers, which you're gonna see on the left side right here, customer questions and answers. Now, here's what's cool. A lot of shoppers go here and trust this more than reviews. They know that reviews sometimes get manipulated. Well, if someone's taking the time to write this out, this tells me something about the owner. And of course, what other shoppers say is important too. Look at this. Could you front carry it instead of placing it on the back? And the answer is yes, you can. And the backpack has built in chest bucket. I think they mean buckle. They should get their spelling right. To secure either you place it on front or back carrying. And it's by interfashioners who is the seller. Look at the next one. Could you make one available for a 20 pound dog with fan, with the fan? Thanks for asking. Yes, we could. And then they explain their options and even offer an email to reach out to them. Every single one of these questions has been answered by the seller that I can see. And it's answered first by the seller, not after someone else answered it. That tells me commitment. And what I love about it is they talk to their customer like you would talk to a friend. It's not super formal and it's not lackadaisical. It's just like you would talk to someone who's a friend. Hey, great question. Thanks for asking. Here's what I recommend. Or yes, you can do this. Or thank you for sharing that. That's something we can improve on in the future. 
If you are building a brand on Amazon or about to, I would like to know your number one most important question for private labeling a brand, please comment below. And if you enjoyed this video, please thumb up it, subscribe, and we will be giving you more content very soon. You have an awesome day. Tiki wants you to like and subscribe to Just One Darn. Ring the bell for notifications.